Welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast, empowering filmmaking entrepreneurs. Hey everyone, welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast, and as you heard, it's sort of a new tagline, empowering filmmaking entrepreneurs. I used to have it say, filmmaking freedom for the independent, but honestly, that never really took off. (laughs) um, I I think it was maybe a little too confusing, but uh, I think uh, empowering filmmaking entrepreneurs is straightforward. Um, what this podcast is all about. And if you're new, welcome. Um, I hope you can catch some of the uh, past episodes. I've actually been on a, like a long summer break. I haven't produced any um, podcasts. Not that I haven't been recording any. I actually have a lot of them stockpiled. I just haven't been able to publish any of them until now. But before we jump into this um, lengthy podcast episode today, um, I have to mention to everyone that the podcast is sponsored by the book how to make and sell your film online and survive the Hollywood implosion while doing it. It's available in a paperback, a Kindle ebook, as well as an audiobook. In fact, you can get the audiobook for free when you go to survivetheimplosion.com. That's right, when you sign up with Audible for a free trial, you can get the book for free. Again, that's at survivetheimplosion.com. Okay, today's episode is entitled Filmmaker Problems. <laughs> you know, more money, more problems, or just no money, more problems. Um, there's a lot of problems, obviously, that we can list that uh, filmmakers go through, filmmaker struggles, filmers, filmmaking stress, the stress of filmmaking. But I'm joined today by the Indie Film Coach over at IndieFilmCoach.com. It's Ron Newcomb himself. And we just banter back and forth about a couple different topics, about things like, you know, how big of a deal money is in terms of funding your films as well as should you make a short film or a feature film and a bunch of other topics. What's interesting is that Ron is coming on to the Film Trooper podcast is uh, in later episodes to host and to interview other uh, industry professionals um, as I um, am off and about doing some other things that I'll be reporting back to the Film Trooper audience um, sporadically here and there. So I'm not totally going away. It's just simply that um, in order to create more content on a regular basis, um, I've asked Ron to come in to help, and he is more than willing to uh, do so. And he's got um, a lot of people that he's going to be interviewing that I haven't had a chance to interview. So just to make sure that the Film Trooper podcast continues to go on, that gives you, provides you a lot of content with this focus of helping you, the entrepreneur uh, filmmaker. Um, Without further ado, let's just get into the conversation uh, just be like a fly on the wall of just Ron and I bantering back and forth about filmmaker problems here on the Film Trooper podcast. Tell me how you came about uh, the indie film coach and what have you experienced, uh, what, you know, clientele wise, like who, who have you been working with in terms of what, um, what pain points have your clients been, um, you know, experiencing as well as yourself? And we kind of give a little background of like how you get started. So I will hand the mic over to you, sir, and just like, give us a rundown. Like, how'd you, how did you get, how'd you find yourself in this crazy business? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it started out, of course, with the passion and the love for film and doing my own projects. And once you start to go down the field a little bit and you start to garner a little bit of success, but more importantly, getting experience, that experience becomes valuable especially to people whom you're a little further down the road with. And so I began to um, start out doing helping out on features. And then I got asked to direct and then found my way into producing. And with that, when I decided then to produce my own feature film, you suddenly run the gauntlet of all these experiences that people know they need to have in filmmaking and yet are either intimidated or nervous to kind of take it to that next level. So the big one, of course, is raising capital, you know, raising money. So how do you how do you go about that and what do you do and all that stuff? And all the way through, though, from budgeting and scheduling a local indie production and then the coveted distribution, how to get how to how to do that. And once I was able to kind of do all those things Suddenly, I found myself uh, getting asked to talk and to speak, and I had written down a ton of notes. And before I knew it, I had, with all my talks and then just my own experiences, I had a good portion of a book that started to form as, as a result of that. And really, it was the business lens 
that I was looking through so often. You know, I kind of akin it to no one ever taught me how to write a check. I, you know, it's <laughs> yeah. crazy enough. I just had to figure out how to write a check, and which is kind of weird. But, you know, I, I really wish that someone had kind of showed me the ropes a little bit of just these basic things that some people took for granted. And in the film world, I find it very, very similar. And then you, you're once you take on the responsibility of taking on someone else's money, it, it, that becomes a very real thing that you're responsible for. And, you know, people are wanting to do it to excellence. I've never met a filmmaker that is, you know, not wanting it to succeed. So they want to position themselves the best way possible. And then, of course, it kind of started to get word of mouth where I was someone, at least in my local area, that was able to find a little bit of success, at least kind of cracking uh, some of the code of these things. And so I started to get asked to help out on other projects. And I found that I had a love for teaching and empowering other people. And so I, with the encouragement of some others, they kind of were saying, you know, you're pretty good at this. Why don't you kind of go out to the internet and really hyper-focus on the indie entrepreneur? And so that's where I've been kind of, you know, gearing to, and that's how really the indie film coach kind of sprung up as a result of all that. Interesting. So what, um, I guess we'll just cut to the chase. Like what kind of stuff, like you said, in the money problem, when you're, you know, when people come to you, your clients or, you know, uh, aspiring filmmakers come to you, what is the answer to that in terms of, um, you know, I don't know, how do we all answer that question of like the yeah. money problem, raising capital for the project? So how do you how do you tackle that? So I, I had a saying that I kind of claimed that money is not a problem. It's the problem. If we had money, we'd be you and I would be talking, you know, what we're filming this weekend, you know, right. it, it, we would, we would have it. And yet I have to admit that I've evolved in that thinking, you know, mm -hmm. I really have changed a lot with the, the advent of production costs getting lower and DSLR cameras and self distribution, all the thing that a good film trooper does. <laughs> suddenly I find myself, uh, answering it differently because, you know, here's the thing. If you've been in it long enough, you find these what you think is an overnight success is never an overnight success. Right. The average indie film that I have found, uh, it has taken seven years average from the moment someone said, you know what, I'm going to do a film to the <laughs> moment that they actually were through distribution, which, of course, you're never really done with it. Once it's out there, you're always trying to to nurture that little baby along. But I always held the. Uh, the mantra of kind of a Hollywood or bust, you know, it was, I was going to get into the studio system or it, you know, it just wasn't worth it or doing short films didn't make sense to me because there was no monetary return. You know, everything had to kind of revolve around this, this epic money problem. And so it's taken seven me years to do something and I'm 44 now, the math didn't add up. You know, mm -hmm. if if I keep on this route, I've got about two, three more films in me and I'm done. You know, that that's I'm going to have to tap out. And that's not cool with me. I have way more, more stories to tell, at least that I want to tell. So I began to think differently about money. And one of the things that we do is I think that we empower money more than it's meant to have. We treat it almost like a God. We have this love hate relationship with it. We love to have it and it's hard for it for us to let it go and to spend um, but how do you kind of crack the code as uh, an independent filmmaker? And I think that's the first step is your mindset matters. The way you look at money matters. And we all know, you know, I don't need to tell anybody how many tests are out there that your mindset matters. You know, there was a, a great example, though, where there was some guys that they were trying to get their free throw shot better. Mm -hmm. And so they they put 20 on the bench and 20 at the free throw line. And for 30 minutes every day at the end of practice, they would shoot uh, one mentally and one, you know, down at, on the on the thing. And of course, you can kind of get to the punch there that the people on the bench had a better percentage increase because in their mind's eye, every shot was a swish. Every shot was perfect. And we have to kind of begin to think differently when it comes to money. 
filmmakers, indie filmmakers, need to stop thinking that it's a home run or nothing. Hitting singles is the way to go. You know, it's funny, and and as writers, we know rewriting is is what we're supposed to be doing. Writing is rewriting. But as filmmakers, it's one of the few art forms where it's, oh, you're supposed to knock it out of the park or you may never get a chance again <laughs> to do it, you know? Um, and so you, we have to... I, I try to tell people, I try to tell my clients that you have three projects that you, you kind of have going on. You have your studio project. I'm not anti-Hollywood. You have your big studio film project. You have your indie film project. And then you have what I call your epic intentional short project. And even your indie project, your feature, you know, you can shoot local and you can shoot it smaller. Even with that, I generally have two budgets. I have the budget I want to have and the budget that what's the minimal thing I can shoot it on, you mm-hmm. know? Is it 500 bucks, you know, on, and I'm, I'm doing it solo? <laughs> you know, is, is that the answer? Or, you know, could, could, could there be another, another way to it? So it's funny. Us, I tell people also that indies, we can back into just about any budget. I can, you tell me what, <laughs> you know, what's the budget, yeah. and I'll begin to tell you what we can do as a community to to kind of to kind of get it there. So the first thing is that that money matters and we need to stop giving money money power and authority over us. And then also the mindset of having a 9 to 5 equals failure. Cuz so many filmmakers if you're not working vocationally in the field, you feel like a failure. And that's so not the case. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. And I began thinking differently on that uh, is going to is going to help you get over that kind of Hollywood or bust mindset. Uh, Walt Disney, I, I think, said, we don't make movies to make money. We make money to make more movies, <laughs> you know, and I love that. And again, it's kind of that mantra of um, putting money in its in its position, in its in its place. Uh, so we have the have the power over that. And then, um, you know, doing short films, I think, is a great way to get around the money problem, too. Uh, The number one thing that we spend on indie film productions generally are is your craft services, you know, craft services and your insurance. So if we if you do a short film and generally what I like to do is anything I can film in a weekend generally five pages a day. So like a little 10 minute short, because mm-hmm. it's a sprint. I can ask people to commit, hey, just give me two days. And people generally are able to do that. And so trying to figure out the resources economically can help figure out that money problem um, also. And you're not waiting around for someone else to give you the opportunity. You're doing short films because, and and they're what I like to call intentional epic shorts <laughs> because there's intentionality there. People love, when you have a really nice reel, um, that matters, that means something. You know, I had an investor one time, finally, I, he kept, finally came in and the reason he said he came in is I just kept doing stuff. You know, I was just out there, I kept creating and he was like, you know what, Ron's gonna do it with or without my money. I'm going to, you know, put in and, and let's see what we can do together. So, you know, I think there's something to be said by just getting out there and and filming. And when people see you doing stuff, uh, people start to come and give in, thus lowering the threshold of what you need to raise for like a, a, a capital raise. And even on features, you know, I've had people really gift their time uh, on things. Um, and then lastly is to be ready. It's to have the that studio project ready to roll your epic indie feature project ready to roll and then your short film kind of ready to roll so that when you can pull the trigger on these things uh time is not not stifled so that's helped me kind of get around the money problem is your mindset uh you know doing in shorts intentional shorts and then being ready to go with um having my productions or having scripts that I can start to move down range on. Yeah. Yeah. And as you mentioned, like keeping a day job, you know, if you, yeah, that's, that's fine. Actually, I want to add to that because it's mentioned, it's interesting. You talked about the not giving money its power um, over you. Um, 
I was just talking to a friend about this and he was mentioning like th- there's this feeling like there's so much content being made and he's and there's this question in the independent film circles where you feel like where are these people getting the money? Like where is all yeah. this money coming from to make these projects? Um, and you're like, you know, and where can I get some of that money? That type of thought, yeah. that process, that thought process. And then, you know, we had ta- discussed before, there's um, this other venture I'm, as I'm embarking on. There's this, the leaders in that space, they talk about it like, listen, money is everywhere. That's really crazy to stop and really think about this. Money is everywhere. What you're looking for is the deal. Yeah. It's, it's not necessarily like there's no money. We can't find enough money to raise, you know, raise it for the project. The people with money, um, what they're looking for are deals or yeah. a project or something that is worth their time and effort. And uh, so that once you put your head wrapped around that, you're like, okay, so let me just work, let me focus, hyper focus on the deals. And it's interesting you talked about um, sort of that focus of, you know, the short film, having your plan, have the bigger project ready to go. Um, you, you, you mentioned something early, just that it, it reminded me of these experts in the, in the business field, like these multimillionaires. And they talked about like the people they work with. Uh, when they see the difference between somebody who's just struggling, just not quite getting there over the hump of success in terms of their profession uh, or their craft or their business, um, and those that do, is is that ninety percent of uh, the people out there among among us, um, we all know what we don't want in life, and only ten percent or so only have a really crystal clear vision of what they want what they do want in life. So that so the exercise is what you would do is take 10 people that you know, friends, family, and just ask that question. So what don't you want in life? And they'll just rattle off. Oh, God, I don't want to be doing this job anymore. I don't want to do this. I, you know, I just I, I want to be in a different school. I do this. I, you know, out of debt. Like all the stuff they, they don't want. Then you stop them like halfway through abruptly and ask them, what do, you, what do you want out of life? And then a lot of them may end up you know, pausing and thinking like, well, that's a good question. Let me think about it. Well, I don't know, maybe this, like they're very unclear. And mm-hmm. the ones that are really super successful that are on a track, they, they can tell you almost like in a very clear one minute, two minute, um, or not one minute, two minute, like a one sentence or two sentence clarity. This is what I want. This is what I'm going for. And what happens then is that the, you said the, the mental aspect of it, it comes super, super focused. And that way yeah. they, they can start saying no to anything that doesn't fit into that laser focus of the goal. Yeah. And so th- in order to do that, you have to write it down. You have to say it out loud. You have to believe it. You have to like, it has to be ingrained into you. And, mm-hmm. um, and I'm going to be honest with like, you know, you and I just talking, these are things I struggle with. Yeah. Like I might have, I've written down a lot of things like I want to do this and I'll go down that path. But I've said yes to many, to, to way too many things that have yeah. deterred that path. Like I right. haven't said no to enough, you know, once I got really clear. And you know what? I'm going to, for those who are listening, it's okay sometimes when you don't really know what you want. Yeah. So, you know, that's the, that's the scariest, that's one of the scariest parts is, it's, you might be at a moment in your life where you're stuck and you're like, I really don't know. Like I, I love making movies. Yeah. I love, I want to be part of this thing, but I don't, ha- I still don't have a clear vision of what that is. And, and that as long as you're, you know, candid and honest with yourself, you can start working on that and maybe chipping away. So maybe you do start chipping away by writing out a list of things that you don't want to do or you don't want to have in your life. And then, then flip that to well, how does that manifest into a really sharp goal and focus of what I do want. I guess it's the same thing. I was mm-hmm. talking to my daughter about this. It's interesting, like how that concept that when you are driving in, around the you know the freeway, and maybe you just focus on like a car you're going to get. I'm going to get a you know a Toyota Prius. All of a sudden, you start seeing Priuses all over the place, like, yeah. because your brain has like triggered. This is what I'm focusing on, and yep. they've been there the whole time. It's just that that you decided to like this is what I'm focusing on. Um, and then, and try, try that exercise, then shift it. Like then tomorrow says, I'm, I'm just going to look to see how many red, um, you know, Kia Sorrentos are out there, or I don't think mm-hmm. they make red. It's like, like how many Kia Sorrentos I'm going to find on the road. Boom. Then all of a sudden now you're seeing them all over the place and you ignore all the other cars. 
what that tells you is that our ability to be laser focused and and like shut everything else out is we're capable of doing it. And like like you said, having a different perspective on the money aspect of of, of raising capital for movies um, could change if you just change it to like you mentioned, um, not feeling like there's a scarcity like. There's not enough. Mm-hmm. I can't find it, and and and, mm-hmm. and remove that vocabulary from your your language. Like I, those words like I can't find it. I can't get it. I don't know where all this stuff, all this, all this sort of negativity, as opposed to the declaration of there is a lot of money out there, a lot of money out there. What they're looking for is a great deal. So yeah. what like is that. what is it in my game plan that that makes what I'm doing a great deal? So now everything yeah. is positive, but it's really, really focused. So anyway, that's what you, you, what you were mentioning reminded me of all the stuff that just sort of solidifies. And maybe that you know, could help filmmakers as they listen to this change that mindset. Tell me about another thing that sort of is like a barrier or a pain point of filmmakers that maybe we could banter back and forth on. Yeah, you know, it kind of stemming off a little bit of what we talked about uh, earlier but it is this conversation, and I get asked this a lot, do I do short films or do I not do short films? Mm-hmm. And again, originally I was thinking, you know, there's no monetization of it. So no, I'm out. Now, granted, this was like, uh, whatever, 10 years ago um, when, I'm, when I was trying to, to really do features. But I, you know, I only had that one script. It was kind of that Hollywood or bust mantra And so, again, I went almost seven years with not doing anything. And suddenly shorts became these little bite sized chunks, these little sprints that became um, really a good way to cut my teeth on, to work on my craft. And when I went to that investor, which I've I've been able to pitch a few times, I did have that reel, that that body of work. Um, And, you know, I like to say that intentional epic short, but I also have done like the 48 hour projects or even, you know, taking my little camera and run around and have my daughters do a little, a little, a little scene. And I put it up there, you know, and edit it and try to tweak it just because I think that it does help hone those skills uh, to do it. But I think that is a question that, you know, we as filmmakers, as storytellers can wrestle with is should I do a short when, what kind Uh, Those types of things. And I think if you answer a few questions, it begins to be like a no brainer. And is this short going to provide training, creative opportunities? Is it going to flush out an idea that you currently have? One of the things that I found in Dewey Shorts is I find the people in my community, in my area that I end up hiring for features with, or they have brought me in on other projects. So it's a way for all of us to stay in production. Because that's the fun part of filmmaking, right? Is yeah. being on set all the time. Films go and die in post production, <laughs> but they are, you know, the fun is staying on set. So tr- my goal is to try to stay in production as often as we can. And you're never going to do that in isolation. You need other people also being in production so that you can jump on theirs and and vice versa. Sure, it's also a great way to develop a certain niche or portfolio in a certain IP range. So for instance, we do, I have a company called Forge Studios and we tailor to fantasy and sci-fi. So it's a good way to begin to showcase that I have several fantasy and sci-fi shorts so that you can see that I can do the feature or a 60 minute opportunity, which we have on there. And so uh, staying in production creates opportunities not just for you, but for everyone around you. And what happens is you start to be known as the the go-to person, you know, Mm -hmm. and people love a winner and they start to jump in with you. They want to be, um, you know, uh, good with that. We had 150 people on a set and I couldn't afford all that. So I simply said, hey, what if everybody kind of put in a little money on it? And it was, we called it filmmaking potluck. So that's what everybody did. So I was able to feed everybody, get production insurance, and then people even brought their own outfits and wardrobe and thing. It was truly a a community uh, event. But then I also think shorts can 
allow you to try out certain CGI elements that you have. It allows you to tell a great story still in a very condensed period of time. Uh, I think all of us out there love Stranger Things, but you can go on YouTube and find those guys, uh, the short film that they did, like their student project, mm -hmm. and you realize why they got Stranger Things. I mean, this little short is really, really well done. And from what I understand, it was their senior thesis project um, with it. You know, I think a short, if it has action, production quality, there's some humor in it, it kind of hits on all these points where suddenly a short is more than just you and some friends going out in the backyard and, and doing something. It actually becomes true storytelling. And when people see that, I think there's some synergy there that you can pull in other people and and it becomes more than just this little project that you're going to go do. It becomes very intentional in nature and become it can become usable. And let's face it, Netflix has changed things. I don't I can't tell you how long the last episodic episode, you know, series was that I watched. I don't know if it was 40 minutes or 60 minutes. I just consumed it. And so these What's defined hardline, I think, is also being changed. So where a short wasn't able to be monetized early on, I think is, has changed, you know. And, and I do think people are out there kind of looking at stuff and showcasing stuff. And then you can also, again, have a body of work that you can show to. So I get asked a lot, should I do shorts or should I not do them? Uh, Ava DuVernay, uh, as we were talking about um like she just gave the advice, like, you know what? It's so inexpensive to make films now. Just make a feature. <laughs> nice. So, but it's interesting because that's one school of thought, but then you, there's a whole other school of thought. Like, yeah, yeah. make as many shorts as possible because um, as long as you're in the game of, you know, working on your craft and working on the craft of storytelling um, and, and seeing what you can make for very little or, you know, or a lot, um, you know, there, there can't be anything wrong because you're still creating something. And yeah. it's interesting because a short of like five minutes long that has high production value, that's out of this world, you know? Yep. Um, I don't know if, you know, just recently the, the latest Game of Thrones episode just really just stirred the internet like crazy because the ending oh, like, yeah. and 10 minutes of that, that's a, say, say that's a 10 minute short film. That thing was bonkers. That was like this, yep. the, 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 the spectacle was out of this world. Versus you might have a 90 minute film like uh, My Dinner with Andre, you know, so yeah. what what makes a feature film or a short film? You know, it's, you know, that 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 question for a filmmaker asking, like, should I just do shorts or do features? And the reality is, is people are just looking for ideas or yeah. they're just looking for something to move them. And you yeah. were mentioning, like, do can at the time a couple of years ago, can you make, you know, money off the short films? And you know, you've been uh, following Film Trooper um, for a while, and one of the things I, that I taught in our Film Trooper Academy, which is like a filmmaking club for uh, aspiring young filmmakers, I gave them an assignment. I said, I'm going to show you the new way of like how films are, how you can make money with mo you're making movies, even the shortest film or the shortest 30-second yeah. web you know, commercial. So there's this concept. Uh, not the concept, but the reality is a lot of filmmakers, um, they have equipment, you know, they upgraded to all this camera gear and they have to either rent out the gear or they're getting hired for their professionalism, their their ability to shoot, edit, you know, sound design, everything like that. You know, it's very rare that we see somebody so specialized. It's so commonplace now, we're beginning to see more and more that the filmmaker of today is somebody that does it all. Like we were writing, yeah. you know, shooting, you know, directing, yep. editing, the whole thing. So a lot of these people are doing, um, you're getting hired by a company. A company either hires an ad agency or they come to you directly. Can you help me do some industrial videos or industrial training videos? Or can you do, help me do some web commercials? Or like this ad agency is hiring this production company. We want you to do this, uh, these, you know, these um, video, um, you know, commercials or let's say commercials that are going to be for the web or the, actually for television, you know? Mm -hmm. So like... This is where people are making their money because they're getting paid bigger bucks because it's coming from an ad revenue, ad source or a company source. But the mm -hmm. whole, if you really break that down, everybody is there trying to advertise and promote a product uh, or this company. 
So the interesting thing is this production company, you know, a, a, a bunch of guys that own the equipment and they get hired by an ad agency to, you know, to make this, these commercials or these web, you know, videos or whatever it is, they get their, they get their money. That's how they make their living. And, but on the, uh, you know, but they always have like this passion project, like then we're doing our short film or we're doing the 48 film, you know, festival project. And like, and everybody's got their own little passion projects that they're trying to do. Again, mm-hmm. I was talking to another friend who's in the Hollywood, you know, system. And he's like, the, even though you meet some people that are in like, they're working on a big budget, you know, movie or some high profile television show. And, you know, there's so many different positions within those, uh, that, uh, you know, what it makes to, to, to make a film or a television series or things like that. You think they'd be happy because they're working on something high profile. But each yeah. one of them has like this like, I don't know, a little bit of angst or begrudgingness because they haven't been able to make their independent film for $250,000. They Like everybody's got their thing. Like that's like yeah. something, doesn't matter what town you're in now. It's like LA is LA. But now yeah. around the world, everybody's got their, like you said, their big studio project or their, yeah. or something bigger or they something they're hoping to make one day. Yeah. And that's really fascinating when you hear that some people sometimes aren't, aren't quite happy where they're at. And then from the outside perspective, it's like, my gosh, but you're where you're working on game of Thrones, you know, or whatever yeah. it is like, yeah. but they still want to make this their own passion project. So yeah. the ex going back to the exercise of how to make money off short films nowadays is one, you can actually just make the short film, upload it to Amazon with Amazon direct video, the free account, uh, and or or pay an aggregator and upload it to uh, submit it to iTunes and uh, Google Play and sell it for like ninety nine cents or whatever it is. You know, it's yeah. like y- yeah. you you can monetize it now if you want to, or even on yep. Vimeo on demand. But the real money comes in if we take the same concept where if you are making your day job is making commercials for an ad agency because they hire you and your production team to do so. The difference is. You make the decision of what products you want to promote. You make the decision of what uh, products or companies that you're going to make your own web videos. And nobody, there's no ad agency involved. It's like you get to, you get to write and direct how you would like to, um, you know, promote this product. So what we did as an exercise for the Film Trooper Academy was I told the kids, all right. We have an Amazon affiliate account. What that only means is that everybody can sign up for a free Amazon affiliate account, meaning that if you can drive traffic to the Amazon marketplace online, and if anybody buys anything through the link that you provided, you might get 3% commission. Or, But if you sell a lot of units, you might get up to 5 6% commission. Mm-hmm. So they, they, you know, which is why Amazon is so dominating, because if you look, yeah. it's not like they are housing all the products. Like if you are trying to sell, if you're a vendor trying to sell anything, you kind of have to have a marketplace. You have to set up a online store account with Amazon because people are going to Amazon as a search engine for stuff to buy. And you yeah. bet if you have anything to sell, you better be part of that. Otherwise, you're kind of out of luck unless you have a really unique high end product that's only exists on your website. So for for what how that works is now we as this this filmmaking club have this account with Amazon and it's like okay, we're going to just pick a product and you guys are going to make a little commercial for it, you know? Hmm. But there's no rules for it. You can do yeah. there you know, you can do whatever you need to do, but as long as you whatever you do when you make the the commercial for it uh, the, or the short film for it, Either way, you look at it, commercial or short film, you're telling a story. Mm -hmm. The end of it, we just supply a link and a call to action of where people could buy the product. So we don't own the product. So we got this link for, we looked up the top, like top selling board games for, you know, on Amazon. And one of them was called Pie Face, which is like this uh, plastic contraption, like this hand that you put whipped cream on it and it, and you put your face in this little contraption and you click the knob like you spin the the dial and says you know click the knob two clicks and you go click click yeah. and it doesn't splat your face and the next person has to go until somebody gets smashed in the face you know with whip whipped cream really goofy gag and you go on YouTube yeah. there's like kids are trying out I think um, Ellen had something too like a, a like a, a bigger version of it it's like it's it was a very popular game it still is 
um, a board game that's sold on Amazon for like whatever, 10 bucks, nothing more than that. So we got yeah. the game. I showed the kids like, here's the product. Yeah. I don't care. What are you guys going to design? So they took uh, like a half hour to uh, work together and they storyboard this whole thing out. Like they're, they're like, we want to make a saw spoof, the movie saw with like jigsaw and like, um, <laughs> But with the with this this goofy thing with the uh, the game with the pie face with the coming in your you know splatting your face, and they we we they designed it, uh, they shot it. I helped them you know I was just guiding them, and they finished it. And I just told them to make sure that you have some sort of call to action that sends people to the link where to buy right. it. So all said and done, like a day or two, the thing was finished. We put it onto Facebook and YouTube and it didn't go viral, but what they, it made a, you know, had a, whatever, a few hundred views, maybe a thousand views. But what they saw was they made a few sales. So they saw the process of, look, nobody told us we couldn't do anything. We could literally just pick a product, you know, anything on Amazon and we could decide what we want to sell and we and we can creatively just make something and there's no rules nobody's telling us we can't do this so we do it they do it and they have a simple link at the end you know it's really easy to click to and that sends people to the uh the Amazon link to buy some stuff so they saw that then they made a few bucks so they saw that yeah. they saw the process and so once right. you absorb that process you're like okay what if the thing went really viral like yeah. you know and then what if we sold a product that was like worth a lot more than just 10 bucks Hence, what we see happen in the world of um, like YouTubers that are basically giving us, you know, f- camera gear reviews. Like they'll say, hey, here's the latest, you know, HDR, 4K camera, and this is the lighting equipment, and this is my review of it. And if you, you know, if you want to buy it, use my links below. So all of a sudden, you know, their review, like their video of how they use the uh, camera gear gets like half a million, a million views. And then you got to think that a percentage of that actually went and clicked on their Amazon links and they bought the camera of like 500, you know, like a high dollar amount. And those who are doing it well, um, I know in the Amazon world, they're making a couple hundred to a couple thousand dollars a month just doing that. So with that said, now you have an an opportunity to say, I'm just making my short film because I just I'm writing it. But Maybe you have a producing partner who says, that's cool. Is there something in there in our short film that we can not to, not to necessarily say that we have to always like sell stuff from Amazon, but the, sure. the principle, principles are there. Is there some other sort of call to action that sends people to something you know, to do or to buy yeah. or to sign up with? I just met with a, a young man who is part of this um, Portland um, uh, – uh, summer program for d- young documentary filmmakers with social so, social change. So he made a, a short film, uh, the documentary about the houseless problem. And that what I've discovered, they it's a term, not homeless, but houseless. And this concept that people are uh, could be without a home, but still have a home, like they have friends and family. These are people mm-hmm. that are have or houseless, which have with without shelter. And so he does yeah. this. He does. He, I see. I sh- see his short film, and I said, "Look, all you need to do is like you don't really have a call to action." And most call to actions we see in, in documentary filmmakers are like, "For more information, go to this." I said, mm-hmm. "You need to do something a little bit more visceral, emotional, and and apply uh, marketing and copywriting to the end of your movie as a really strong to call to action." So yeah. he he was like, "Okay, so it it it's going to end." Instead of like the end credits popping up, you'll just see the call to action will be something to the kin of, um, if you know, sh- like share this film and donate one dollar to a, a a link that's really easy for people to go to, like right. you know, f- stophouseless.com dot com or whatever it is, um, and then say like if a one a million people you know gave a dollar each. We could, you know, whatever the the stats are, they can um, build housing for about half a million people or something like that. Yeah, right. You know, so to make it much more emotional, much more yeah. direct to say, here's what you can do in the moment of time. Because if you just put like for more information, 
people are just they're not there's not going to take action it's got to be that yeah. thing i think one of the, the, the greatest ones we saw was like for a dollar a day or whatever it is you can help feed uh, all these starving children in africa you know yeah so that's a tagline that's in our head so it's you know what i'm getting at is those who are listening if you're making these short films think about what the what the end result is at the call to action are you can you sell a product without feeling like you're selling out uh, if you're doing like a social cause thing, can you drive people more effectively to the organization that is doing the work that, that you need volunteer work or donations or you know money or things like that? And really think about what that, um, that call to action is in, in the copywriting and the marketing aspect of it. And marketing is not, should not be a bad word and shouldn't be something that's uh, looked down on. Um, and that's what we did for the pie face game. We, the, the kids were like reading – the back of the box and we just had this button that says you know buy now if you want to have all this fun with the pie face and like you know they just had fun with it <laughs> and so it was it, it's that was a big revelation for a lot of young people because now they see because they're they're a youtube generation they see it they're like oh yeah, yeah. i follow all these youtubers and i totally see oh, yeah. what they're doing once you kind of unveil like oh that so that's the business model so i see so if i can just I can pick the product. I can pick this company that I want to promote. And, um, you know, I'll just make my own creative movies. I don't know if you knew, like, there was, a, there was one, there was a guy who did, like, this uh, heart-wrenching uh, film, uh, short film with Adidas about this, like, a, like a, a elderly home where, like, the orderlies were keeping all the elderly people, like, you know, almost like prisoners. And one mm -hmm. of this old man was, like, got these Adidas tennis shoes, and he's trying to break out, and he breaks free. So they had this, it was very emotional. And, like, you know, Adidas didn't, you know, they kind of, they try to stymie the commercial because it wasn't officially sanctioned. If the filmmaker just added a simple, like, Amazon link to a bunch of uh, uh, Adidas shoes... He would have been fine because that, that that video or that commer that short film got like millions of views. Oh man! You know what I mean? Like, yeah. um, like I see it a lot. I see a lot of these amazing short films that get a ton of viral, like uh, you know, sharing, and it just I see yeah. the numbers, but they don't. They no, none of them have an effective call to action. None right, of them have right. a, a something to do that can take it to the next level. Um, my daughter. Yep. Uh, my daughter shared with me this other commercial. She goes, this commercial is hilarious. It was about this like this uh, service that basically takes all your Instagram photos and collects them on a, on a monthly basis and prints them out for you in a, in a photo book and sends them to you. That huh. way you don't have to worry about building a collection of uh, Instagram photos or, or, or photos like – you know, moms that are busy trying to build out like photo books. Like this is a service that just is dialed in that way. The commercial, yeah. this web commercial is ridiculously hilarious and it goes for like five minutes. So just, I looked at it as like, this is a hilarious five minute film that, yeah. that is entertaining, that is, you know, shareable and it's like 2 million views or whatever it is. But it's, yes, it's definitely a commercial advertising a service, but nobody feels like they're being sold to because right. the value of the comedic value of the commercial was entertaining enough that you sat through the whole thing that you want to rewatch it again because it was hilarious. Uh, yeah. One more example I'll give you before we jump into the next topic. The, um, are you familiar with the book Thug Kitchen? No. Okay, so this, this – these you oh here's another thing <laughs> filmmakers get hired sometimes by a production company to do what make book trailers you've seen like yeah. this phenomenon like you oh know, yeah absolutely yeah. so they do like this over dramatizing uh of of a snippet from the book to help sell the book right well these guys did this really funny version uh where it starts off it looks like you know like a cialis commercial or like a drug commercial and and really what it is is it's shocking because the comedic value value is all the uh, f bombs they throw into it, basically <laughs> saying like, you know, um, maybe you should start giving a f giving a beep about the yeah. what, what you eat. And this whole thing is called Thug Kitchen. And this was a, a really funny commercial that was on the web that got shared like tons, and it was all meant for uh, pushing the 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 release of this book called this cookbook called Thug Kitchen. And we yeah. bought it because of that commercial because it was too hilarious not to try it out. They right. had like I think in the first month of sales or from that video they had like almost 200,000 sales of the book. You know, wow. so again, 
They didn't sell out. I mean, they created something yeah. that had no rules. It, it could go as long as it wanted to, as long as it needed to. It was a funny short film that, yes, it sold the product at the end. But it was it, the product they were selling was still in alignment. It never felt like it was cheesy at the end. Uh, there was another product out there called um, – uh, it was like this little stand you put – uh, and it was help your when you go to the bathroom to go poop, and it yeah. was the, the the squatty potty. The squatty potty. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. like I mean these are funny videos. Yeah. So they were out sure. there. So now you're you're in the sci-fi and fantasy stuff. Yeah. I mean it's you could do like this whole like short film on like uh, I think you were talking about some like a project you're working on the Vikings and so on like that. Yeah. At the end of your movies, you could have a really just call to action like. Um, you know, get more or, or something like get a ton free more stuff at, you know, vikingshortfilm.com or whatever it is. Yeah. But so the whole point is when people go there is like you can give them like behind the scenes stuff or a, a lot of people in that world, they love the, this concept of cosplay. Like how did you do yep. the special effects makeup or how did, yep. how did you build your costumes or how did you, especially in the fantasy world? I had another client that, that, that had something like that. I said, look, you really tap into that. People want to know, like, how did you make, you know, that that makeup? How did you make the costume? All that kind of stuff. And if you yeah. if you supply links to the makeup and tutorials or how you build these things, you know, that's the added value to the the film that you made. And you yeah. actually may end up making that. Now you're seeing like there's a business model to it. That's, that's right. Outside of the Hollywood system, you're on yep. your own. This is the world of the web. Um, yep. you know, before net neutrality kills it all. But anyway, the, uh, yeah. <laughs> but Ding. yeah. So anyway, I know I babbled a lot there, but I wanted no, to man, add, add to yeah. that, uh, the short film concept of how to approach it in a different business model. Yeah, no, I, I love it. And, and one of the things that, um, I'm taking notes myself. I mean, one of the things that we try to do is, <laughs> is we have this IP, uh, the Rangers. And so we did a Kickstarter, raise a little money. We have a 40 minute free version. You can go online or you can get a 60 minute extended version, you know, for a little bit more money you, on our VHX channel. But what we've invited some uh, creatives to do is if you don't have a world to play in, we're kind of opening up our world to play in. So, and we also continue doing shorts in that world. So it just is another way to kind of give credence to people and really an excuse to go out and do something of excellence. It's almost like just streamlining a filmmaker saying you have a bunch of different ideas, but OK, hyper focus on on this IP for a moment, you know, and it's kind of this together filmmaking mantra that we're better together than we are apart is a kind of a phrase that we say at, at our studio. So, no, I love the fact that, um, you know, the, the call to action that uh, is brilliant with the with the young people that, that you did. So now that that's that's good stuff. You know, it's funny you talked about your um opening it up this world to the other filmmakers and, and, and creating that community. Yeah. Um, really, I think if there's one thing you've heard of probably, you know, over the years is like, everybody's talks about build your audience or build an audience. And again, the only reason they say that if you really strip away, what that means is that if you're able to, you know, harness like a fan base or an audience that likes the stuff you do, they don't, if they like your feature films, yes. You know, if they like your short films, if they like your micro films, if they like your video tutorials or how you made your films, you know, yeah. if that is your fan base, that is your fan base and that's your audience. Uh, as long as you enjoy sharing with them the content that you're creating, you know, because yep. as, as soon as you do it where you feel like it's you're you're doing it because it's a business decision, you're going to be soulless and be inauthentic and people will see right through that. People yeah. love it when they have somebody truly, truly loves what they do, and they love that they that person is sharing what what they're sharing. Um, yeah, um, I have an affinity for um, marketing business, and in terms of trying to understand it better, which is what Film Trooper is based on. But so I just do it for the love of it, just sharing, like just seeing different business models pop up and go, wait, this could be applied to the world of independent artists or things like that. Yeah, but. The reason behind that is like if anybody out there listening is like, okay, build an audience. The reason you do that because that creates leverage. That creates value. Yeah. Because don't even worry about trying to go to Hollywood or anything. They will come to you. If you create something 
they're you know they're it's not like a lot of these um you know hollywood studios have like th- their fan base it's not like i'm going to the movies this weekend because oh i can't i love all the paramount films or the, yeah, the warner Brothers right. films we don't care there's no loyalty no. there Zero. you know so they're they're going to look to partner with somebody that already has some leverage loyalty yeah. amongst a group of people so that can be done anywhere in the world because at the core yep. of it is you build it it's years it, the the audience is you know as long as you don't you know disavow them or piss them off you know as long as you harness it and you take nurture them you take care of them and they enjoy what you make um, that is the key because you have leverage because yeah. that leverage can do anything then you can you can make your own meetings you can say hey guess what um, you know, I'm out here in, uh, you know, Georgia or Atlanta or New Orleans or I'm in Monta- Montana or Kansas or wherever I'm at. He goes, but I built this audience of X amount of thousands of people. They're very yep. loyal. I have this content. You know, I'm going to take this uh, uh, this opportunity. To, I think that we can expand what we're doing. If, I, if I'm just going to make some calls to certain companies or c- certain, you know, film producers or whatever it might be, they say, I have something of value. Let's have a meeting. Because nothing ever happens, you know, because of one meeting. It never happens yeah. because, oh my gosh, Ron, I met you, I read your script, I, I, I'm yep. going to give you a million dollars right now. I, this is amazing. Let's just make this thing happen. It's yeah. one meeting after another meeting after ten years of meetings or whatever it is that that they see that you are continuously, like you said, you were somebody who's active in your local film community of making mm-hmm. stuff, making stuff, and then an investor, maybe a small scale, big scale said there's value in that i'm putting some money behind it and that's the leverage that everybody needs to sort of build if you're trying to build this sustainability this viability and especially you know you and i are looking to help the same uh demographic of people which are serious filmmaking entrepreneurs not just hobbyists that are coming in like oh i just wanted to see what this be like you know, there's That's other right. there are other sites, other podcasts, other things like that that probably fit the bill better for you. This is for the much more serious ones that are getting through the funnel of like I've made a one film, I made a few films, I still love it, but I'm still trying to figure out what are what models can I follow that give me yeah. this freedom, but also sustainability, and where I don't feel like I have to sell my soul or sell out to some a system that doesn't seem like it works for me. So that's yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. No, you know, um, you, when you were interviewing Stephanie Palmer with um, mm-hmm. a good in a room, you know, she was talking about what's the goal of this meeting. And it's usually to get to the next meeting. Yeah. You know, it's, it's rarely let's sign the deal. Can you write the check? It's always going in knowing that the goal is likely going to be, you know, get to the next meeting. Hey, let me let me throw a question yeah. at, at you, Scott. So. At your time, um, it was with PlayStation, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Twelve so years. You, you were, were they considered like short cinematic shorts that you were doing just in the particular IP that you were kind of parsed out to do? Okay, you're going to go do this game, and it's a, a commercial, if you will, but kind of a short little entity with that when you were working, kind of little sprints that you were doing. Yeah, we were it, we were an in house department, so we worked on. Um, what happened was a game developer would say, we need X amount of, you know, um, we need some movies made to tell the story of our game in between all the different levels. Um, okay. This is, and early on, you could go down the what they call the pre-rendered uh, path, uh, which is just canned movies, or because at the time, the in-game, what they call in-game engine, the game engine, um, the, the, the programming wasn't there just yet to have full-blown in-game cinematics. Um, we were doing like a hybrid where we would take sometimes okay. the in-game cinema, uh, in-game assets that were, you know, game quality, and then we would still have to do editing and visual effects and things like that. Um, and, and so you see it a lot, you know. So we were considered, it'd be very much the same thing as the fellow who did uh, the first Deadpool movie. He's coming from Blur, and Blur animation studios did a lot of the the animation work for world of warcraft so you would see these amazing cg you know uh movies uh that were used to tell the story of like world of warcraft and they use a lot of that for their um commercial production you know so they were independent studio 
you're working for a few clients doing these epic cinematic you know sequences we happen to be an in-game i mean in-house studio so we were paid by sony to work with right. with different teams <clears throat> in sony so um yes they were short films and that that crossed over to we would have to do short films for the games and then we would have to do um that turn into like commercial promotional material so it ran the, the you know working with the marketing department. So we yeah, were all yeah. over we were all over the place in that respect. But um, and and sometimes it was full blown uh, all CGI or animated um, you know CG sequences. Sometimes there's two D uh, animation sequences we did. We did live action combined with visual effects. It was oh, it was just cool. a mini you know mini visual effects studio, and you see that all over the place um, now. A lot of independent uh, studios out there. In fact, the guys from the third floor. Um, we helped them get started um, when they left Lucasfilm. So hmm. Skywalker Ranch, Lucas had developed an art department for the prequels for the Star Wars films. And uh, they really pioneered the pre-visualization uh, format using uh, 3D animation. So they were just doing roughs. So they were able to do all these rough cinematic sequences and they hand that off to all the different visual effects companies to, to flesh out. But they work very, 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 very closely to George Lucas. Well, when the, the the prequels ended, well, they were they were just independent artists. So yeah. they all formed together, and they formed a company called The Third Floor. And it's called The Third Floor because at the Skywalker Ranch, they were located on the third floor above the main house. And that's where the art department was. And so they needed – they were, like, brand new. They were like, we just formed our company. And so we hired them to do some work for us um, to get them started before – now they're, like, a mainstay. Like, they're – right there in the middle of um, Los Angeles, right in Hollywood. And they've, they've gotten their paws on like almost every major visual effects, you know, um, oh, cool. you know, movie ever. And now they're venturing into virtual, virtual reality and all this kind of stuff. So, um, we, yeah, we got a chance to, to work with those, that, that caliber of talent, you know, all over the place. So yeah. to answer your question, yes, there were basically short films for, yeah. the, for the games. Yeah, no, which which is so cool that they you are telling these short stories in short form and a and yet in a cinematic element and and game and you know it's funny you bring up VR because that's kind of where I was kind of dovetail into is that the there's been an open doorway now for us indies to tell our stories mm -hmm. and we all know VR is not just coming it's here you know but then there's video games to tell story in there's ways to um, get our story out there. And if you're ambitious enough and can kind of see to get into things, there's, there's way to kind of, kind to kind of do that. And VR is a space that is, seems like a little bit of the wild West right now where everybody's kind of dipping into, to, to get into, I'd, I'd be interested to hear from people if, uh, you know, if, if they've been able to kind of, kind of play in that world. It's one I'd like to get into. No, I, I thought about it as myself. I, you know, I think it's different, but it's fine. I think, I think, and somebody's going to figure out something that's going to change it. You're like, whoa, that's yeah. really cool because people are hungry for the content. There's a lot of technology and platforms that are wanting to see what it can do. And um, yeah, it's early on. And, and if we look at through history, you know, uh, those who can adopt the technology early and are able to su succeed with some sort of, you know, success in interpreting it in terms of an art form um, and for what it is, have a, a you know, a greater trajectory of success moving forward, you know, mm -hmm. instead of coming in late. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I've doubt, you know, thought about it a lot. You know, I, I'm definitely interested in all that stuff. Yeah. Um, I've gotten sick, you know, watching the people, you know, that like getting sick <laughs> yeah. is, is something you got to work on, you know, but uh, yeah. yeah, there's a lot to be desired. You know, it's interesting you were talking about when we talk about filmmakers and we talk about Stephanie Palmer, who, you know, Good in Room is about how to pitch and how to get your script ready. And she works with a lot of screenwriters and a lot of writers. Yeah. Um, if anybody's listening, if you, I think the, the real power for the, for the independent filmmaker is, yes, we are making films because we're trying to learn how to use all the gear and all and get better at our craft, you know. But the reality is, is um, it's all about the writing. It's all about the ability to tell stories, um, not about all the technology. You've probably heard it before. And I actually challenge, like, if you really want to know the type of director you're at, if you really want to challenge yourself to ask yourself, be truthful and be have humility, ask yourself, 
am I even a really, am I even a good film director? Am I a good filmmaker? And the way you challenge yourself is, you know what? Bring, try to adapt a famous short story that's in public domain. Something hmm. like from O. Henry or like just go on public domain. Stories that are have stood the test of time, you know, and so there, it's a solid story that exists. And your job is to interpret that or to adapt that into a screenplay format in a short, uh, sc- short screen, you know, short, uh, short film. Something like, you know, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, you know, mm-hmm. take like, uh, was it uh, uh, Tell, Tell, Tell Hearts? Was it Two Tell Hearts? I can't remember that, that famous yeah. short story. Go ahead and adapt that as a screenplay and then film it. Because if you if the film is not doesn't resonate, that tells you that you're not doing a good job adapting you the storytelling. You need to improve your, your skill set. You're not doing a good job doing the adapt adaptation of the screenwriting, you know, because you can't blame the story because the story yeah. exists. It is it's been timeless. It yeah. just says that your ability to interpret it needs improvement and that's the worst thing to see like a, a young filmmaker or, or anybody say i made my film yeah you know the script had problems i don't know we had problems with production like you know all these there's so many th- excuses that go into why it didn't quite work yeah but if you start from the base that says here's a um, public domain story short story there's it starts from a great place my interpretation now that matters because if you can deliver something that and it actually resonates with people, then you can tell yourself, okay, I actually do have the skill set to do that. And I think a yeah. lot of it that we're seeing a lot of independent filmmakers out there um, are just as discovering that they can do this. <laughs> like you know, they have the gear, they've they've gone yeah. through it, and but nobody's really taken the time to harness their ability to tell stories in a written format. And the people yeah. that we're discovering that have like a lot of the power or the influence or or getting things done in the world of like Netflix and Amazons and HBOs, they're coming from the writers' room. Like, yeah, the, you know, they are right. prolific writers that get hired on one crappy show but all of a sudden they're on a good show like they are yep. bouncing from it's the world of the writers and now they're having the the, the power and the, and the ability to translate that into being directors that is a common path that you see all the time and so as an independent if you can make a series of really well crafted stories that are well written and then interpreted in a vid- visual format that would be an amazing calling card to be doing what? Be part of a writer's room or, or you know, or, or projects or helping, you know, do script doctoring, other things in, in that type of career. But if you really do want to challenge yourself to be completely honest with yourself, try interpreting and readapting a famous, you know, short story that's in public domain. Don't you do this to me, Scott. Now you now I got another thing to do. I got another thing to film, man. I got enough stories. Now I need to go out and do that and prove it to myself. No, that that's great, man. That's uh that's good stuff and uh definitely a challenge. You know, it uh it kind of goes into another thing that I deal with a lot is people's fears and uh fear of failing. Okay. You know, yeah. here I am on this podcast. I want to say all the right things and you know, I'm nervous and you're nervous and the the (laughs) listeners are nervous if they can and do things and succeed and all that. And how do we deal with failure? So many people get stifled in this fear that they, it really keeps them immobilized. You know, they almost can't do anything. And what I've found is it's in the secrets of that fear where people don't do anything. And when they're, when they're even so afraid to not tell anyone or talk about it or be honest with it, they just kind of brush it off as I'll do that later or it's not that big of a deal. And they're not really dealing with the root cause of this fear uh, that they have and particularly a fear, fear of failure. I mean, mm-hmm. every filmmaker, every artist, I would even say, gets to a point where they look at what they're creating and go, oh, my gosh, what have I created? This this yeah. stinks. You know, I suck. This sucks. You, know, oh, yeah, every, yeah. you, go, you go through that. Especially in editing is where I find it, you know, most when I'm like, what did we film? Why don't we have this shot or this or that? And yet you stop for a moment, you pause, you go, you know, <laughs> relax for a moment, get get in some good company. And then you come back with fresh eyes and go at it again. You know, you keep chipping away at it and suddenly the story is revealed to you 
because you know the, the way it is uh films are made three times in writing and production and in post yeah and in post man is is where a lot of times where people's fears will come to fruition because they're actually seeing what they have on screen or what they don't have yeah and this is where i do think you, know, you talk about the craft of writing a great writer will ensure that everything is there and a, and a director will ensure that it's captured but then an editor will make sure the story is pulled out and mm -hmm. a great editor there's a famous you know story about uh the jaws editor you know and the yeah. jaws editor kind of kind of saved the day Verna with Fields. the edit yeah yeah ex exactly of jaws and you know dealing with uh the fear of failure is you got to get in the water and do it if this thing has got a hold to you which if you're listening to the podcast and you're a film trooper it has you know it's not just a an affinity it's not a curiosity it's a it's what i would even say is a calling you know this is something it's you know it's it's kind of got a hold to me that you have to get out and do and recognize that you're going to go through kind of that valley experience you have the high of production because that's the fun then the valley experience of being in in post and looking at it in, in the editing lens and saying oh my gosh what did i create and then sticking it out and maybe getting an editor that can tell story to help pull the story out will kind of get you through that. And you need a couple of wins, even if they're minor wins. And by a win, I just mean freaking finishing the film. <laughs> so many films I know, they never finish. They wipe out because for whatever, they have, a, they have that fear of, man, it's just not good enough or it's just not there. And so they don't ever finish anything. Um, it, you know, it, it keeps them stifled. In yeah. That. The fear, yeah. That's a big one. Fear of failure. I think that if people knew, like, uh, I think that's like the famous story, like Christopher Nolan, like they, they try to say that his first film was following, but then there's uh, the legend is he actually does have another film he did before that. He doesn't let yeah. anybody see it because it's, you know, <laughs> but here's the thing, like the interesting thing about it is this is really humbling because anything that we create and we put online, like you can create a short video or short film and put it online and say like 25 people see it it doesn't nobody cares like you know then your second film you make goes crazy and it goes like half a million views a million views you know you can just delete your old movie that got 25 views right. you know if it's terrible you know yep. it's the funny thing is is like with social or being social media or being anything on the internet sharing your work is you put it out there. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. No harm, no foul. Because people, are, we are so bombarded with content. I can't remember half the stuff I yeah. see. You know, yeah. so you can fail so many dif different times and be the crickets, and it's okay. Because one, one, the next or the you know the tenth version of whatever you're doing finally clicks. It's like, oh, cool. That's what people remember. They don't remember. They're not. You know, nobody's holding you to that. And, and like, yeah. this, and, and if they do find it, it's a wonderful story. Nothing's better than seeing someone who's successful or gone on to some sort of success and they bring out some embarrassing thing they've done before because it's humbling. It's to say, like, look yep. at look at this where this actor started or where this filmmaker started. You see the first film like that short film wasn't really that good. And that's sort of to not be afraid to be like be exposed out there um i think yeah. too sometimes a lot of people that maybe are listeners they of the podcast and in this world they have um they have other things going on where their own family support system may not be the most supportive sometimes or their friends mm -hmm. and family like they're they're afraid to, sh to share like this is what my dream is to be a screenwriter or to make a movie i had this idea yeah. and like there that may not be the place you know they're not finding that support so there's that fear too of these other expectations um you know we're like i said we're in our 40s so there's an interesting thing we see this young generation having the, the endless potential you know and then we see, um, but I'm meeting a lot of older people that have always wanted to make a movie or video and they, they're going for it. And yeah. some of them have like, uh, I met a, a fellow who had basically was on the deathbed, had gone through multiple heart surgeries, but he's like, he was an accountant or like a, a financial person. It was like, you know what? I'm going to do this. And yeah. it's one of those things like, good on you. Like, like you yep. said, just finish something. Um, I, I know you and I were like, when we when you sometimes you get to this place where you might be in a transition we're like i still love making movies i still love creating stuff but 
the economics aren't lining up just 100% yet. And so I'm at this frustrating, fearful place of I still got to support for my family, but I, right. I don't want to give up my dream. of. And we'll, yeah. But then you have to get clear. But what is that dream? And so my yeah. I've gotten clear, like much clearer, which is I do enjoy just making stuff and having the ability to share it with an audience or having people respond to it. Whether or not it goes, you know, huge or small, you know, the fact that maybe a hundred people respond to it, I have taken solace saying, that's still a hundred real people. Like if I had a hundred yeah. real people in the room yeah, right. that I'm giving a talk to or I'm sharing my work with, that's real. That's that that should not be discounted. Just because we're seeing ridiculous numbers of like in the hundreds of thousands and millions of views and things like that, you know, getting a hundred views is still valuable to some extent of how you nurture that. You know, yeah. if you reached out to every single person, those 100 people and said, thank you, thank you, thank you, and you had real conversations and, and, and they give you feedback about what they like about your work, what you didn't like, you know, that that's the fuel you'll need. And so mm-hmm. you're under the radar, but you're still, it's valuable and viable to that circle of 100 people you talk to or you make stuff for. Um, yeah. Whether or not you can make the, the monetary stuff from it, again, you know, we're looking at different business models that give us hope or, or like... We're beginning to – I think the dust is beginning to settle in this world of you know, uh, internet marketing and internet content. And we're beginning to see more and more models that are beginning to work. And you know, before, we didn't have that as filmmakers, as independent artists. But it's beginning to take shape. And so we can start applying some of this stuff to our own venture. Um, yeah. But what I, I guess whatever you do, the fear part of it, I think those who are afraid to do so – you, it's okay because hell, I'm. I was afraid to start all this stuff, you know. Yeah. And yeah. I think what it is is like, in, um. But you, it's just trying it one at a time, and it gets a little easier, a little easier, uh, and and before you know it, you know, you're just being, you just be true to yourself. Like, is what kind of art am I creating? You know, what kind of stuff yeah. am I creating? Uh, and. You know, I see where I want to go. I might not be there, but you know, it's really cool. You had somebody with earnest give you feedback. One person. That's sometimes yeah. enough for you to keep going for a whole year. So, I, yeah, I, no, definitely. Yeah, I think it just just take solace in knowing that it's okay. You can throw up a bunch of stuff online, and if it never goes anywhere, don't worry about it. Nobody even saw it. No harm, yeah. no foul. No harm, no foul. Right. Just keep no, going. No, I like it. Yeah, I like it. And and I think in your book you were talking about. You know, we're kind of in the business of exploiting IPs and exploiting yeah. your, you know, your your film. Um, and, you know, the George Lucas, you know, thought of you spent he made more money in the action figures than he than he did the, the, the film. And that's that's kind of some of the things that we're trying to do with the like the Rangers and the fantasy stuff is kind of, you know, bringing back to that potential exploitation of what we have at, in a, as a storyteller um, so, you know, kind of, kind of diversifying that a little bit, you know, it's interesting what you were saying about, uh, the gentleman on his deathbed. So I actually have a master's in counseling, mm-hmm. uh, believe it or not. And of course it makes sense why I'm like a coaching, filmmaker. Yeah. So well, yeah. Look, coaching yeah, and filming. Yeah, coaching, yeah. Yeah. yeah, certainly, certainly. So in the short run, we have a tendency to focus on the stupid things that we did, all of our actions. And we regret our actions in the short run. But in the long run, they've done a study now where people old and gray and on their deathbed in their final days, what they regret is their inaction, what they didn't do. And it's what, I think it's what these, if you're a filmmaker, if you're a film trooper and this thing is in you, then it's that, that's what I fear more is my inaction. I fear that overrides my fear of doing. And then, Hey man, we've all thrown stuff out on YouTube and you know, the young 13 year old breaks our little heart of, cause he just thrashes our work, you know? Yeah. And there's, there's so they could be so daggone mean, but I'm going to keep telling my stories out there cause it does matter. And I, I like your point of, you know, a hundred people is a real hundred people. People always tell me, and I'm not a runner, but yeah. they, you know, if I go out and run three miles, they're like, "Oh, three miles—that's nothing." It's like, really? When's the last time you ran three miles? <laughs> you know, three miles is forever. 
And a hundred views is if they're real 100 view, that's a, you know, imagine the number of people I just went to, uh, the, the opening, uh, weekend film and there was like 20 people in the theater. Oh yeah. So, oh, you my know, gosh. Yeah. yeah, you know, a hundred people is if they're real people. And like you're saying, you're getting some action interaction with them. They're true fans, you know, kicking back to something we said earlier, I was, I got to pitch one of the, um, premium channels. And one of the things they, they talked about was you needed to have at least 5,000 people on Twitter and 20,000 followers on Facebook before they would take the meeting. Like mm -hmm. we couldn't even, couldn't even get in the door uh, to do that. So there's something to be said about, you know, building that fan base, but not discounting the true number of eyeballs that you can get on stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, know, you yeah. earn each one. <laughs> yeah. And like you say, it's, yeah, when you're dead or I, that's, that's where it starts. Like, you know, you, you, this concept of like, we're all going to die. So, you know, that, I guess that saying was like, you, you know, get on living or you get on dying or, you know, the yeah. inaction, all that, all that stuff. It's whether or not you, the, here's one th a tactic that anybody's afraid can do is either hire a coach like yourself or form a, an accountability partner or a group, yeah. or they call it a mastermind group or something like that, where it says, you go to your friend who, you know, well, is not going to deal with your BS. Like if you come to that person and say, listen, I do want to do this, but I'm afraid. I go, I need to just meet with you on a weekly basis to make sure that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And I just want you to hold me accountable. You're just looking for an accountability partner or a group or somebody to keep you in check because there's this thing when it gets going, then you feel this pressure of like, you know, you come the next week and you didn't do what you said you were going to do you feel guilty, you know, it's like you need that hard love sometimes, but that's one way to get over the fear is because, yeah. um, fear is usually because we're so wrapped up in our own self absorbedness. We're just wrapped up our own self. So the other way to get out of it is to try to remove your, your actions from your own personal hangups and help somebody else out or help somebody else achieve their goal. Cause when you're focused on somebody else, it, it, it liberates your, you know, your own deal. Yeah. And so you have two things there. One, help somebody else out, help them be accountable and yeah. vice versa. They will help you be accountable. And that's a, a real world strategy that anybody can use uh, to overcome fear. Um, I yep. formed two mastermind groups and, um, you know, I kicked myself cause I had goals. And I, I, there was a lot of stuff I want to get done. Um, it's, here's the interesting thing is you might have a lot of stuff you want to get done, but if you never done them, did them before, you have no idea how long something takes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like, yeah. they goes, I, I'll, I'm planning to get it done in a week. Um, I was like, oh my gosh. But you know, life gets in the way, other things gets in the way, and you're just like, wow, that's this is taking forever to get finished, and because I've yeah. never done it before. But if you've done it before, then you have an idea like how long something takes. So if you've written, if you made a film before, you know how much work goes into it. So if you're trying to gear up to do the second one, go, okay, I've been down this road before. Um, I got to really give myself some leeway of like how long some of this stuff is going to take. So, yeah. um, you know, those types of things. Like, you know, I, I'm in this crossroad where I, I wrote a movie and I performed it for the film trooper audience and, you know, kind of fell flat. And I was like, damn. So like, this is me going, the self doubt is like, man, I'm not that good, you know, or like not that yeah. it was good, but like, I just didn't make something that was good. So how to make something that's good. And I don't know. I'm in that crossroad of the doubt, but like you yeah, said, man. like you said, some projects take seven years and I'm like, okay, that's what it is then. I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, um, who was the, who was the, the, you, you had a, uh, a guest on, he, he rode around with his dog. Oh yes. Uh, Kelly yep. Baker. He's here. He's, he was a sound designer for all of um, yes. Gus Van Sant's films up here in Portland. He's a USC film graduate. Um, yeah, and he went through two bypass heart surgeries. So he has a different outlook in life. But anyway, yes, yes. And his yeah. book just came out, uh, Road Dog. Yeah. yeah. Right, exactly, Road Dog. 
And, you know, it was interesting. He talked about in the interview you had with him about how he did a screening and this guy, <laughs> the first one right out the gate, got up and was like, that sucked. And, you know, this sucked and everything else about it. But he and it was kind of a, oh, great. What's this going to be like, you know, kind of situation. And he powered through it because he didn't take it personal. He The guy was kind of projecting at the artwork and not at himself. Yeah. And I found that very insightful because I definitely am going to take that personal. Oh, you know, yeah. Gonna, you know, Most of us are. Me. Yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. And he was really good about kind of getting out of himself and saying, hey, I can appreciate that you didn't like that. Not that you don't like me, this this type of thinking. And uh, yeah, it, it really resonated with me because I don't want to react to somebody in, in a self-defense kind of way. You know, maybe they just didn't like the art I put out there, but there, it's nothing against me personally. That I really appreciated that uh, that kind of fact. So you hit another thing that people talk about a lot, of course, is accountability. Yeah. You know, and you can't do accountability in a silo. And I, film is you don't do life really in a silo, and yet it's hard to do film in a silo. So accountability is something where you have to have other people to kind of keep you accountable, and it is where you know doing coaching. It's kind of like a personal trainer. I go to the gym and a personal trainer can help me hold myself accountable. You know, they kind of make you feel a little uncomfortable at times. Yeah. But that's part of the job. Yeah. You know, is to push you beyond your own limits. So accountability, I think having a group or other people uh, helps with that. And then another one people struggle with is um, time management, you know, <laughs> time, God, yeah. which you just talked about. Yeah. You know, you don't know how much time and then next thing you know, life gets in the way and before you know it. It's three months and I haven't even begun the script and the whole bit. And then resources, you know, is kind of the last point that people mm -hmm. just really have a hard time with, especially if you're not in, we'll say L.A., you know, because I agree with you. Hollywood is really just kind of a it's all over now, especially for film troopers. We're talking to people from all over the globe now if you're a film trooper, but you not, might not be in a film conducive environment. You know, yeah. so it might be hard for you to find the resources of other people um, out there. And that's something that I help people to kind of get over to. Usually I find that there is some type of film group, be it at a college or, you know, almost every state has like a film commission of sorts mm -hmm. um, that can kind of help out with those resources. But again, that's where, you know, tying it back to doing short films if you announce you're doing it, suddenly you'll find people to be like, hey, I want in on that, you know, because an actor only gets to be an actor if there's an opportunity to act. Yeah. Otherwise, they're just you know, doing their nine to five, uh, wondering, dreaming about acting. So, yeah, those those are some other things that that people struggle with that I hear quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I agreed. Hey, we're, we're wrapping up sort of like the hour 20 mark here. So let me. um let me know. Is there anything that we didn't cover that, like you said, the because this whole thing started because we wanted to talk about pain points of filmmakers. Yeah. Um, and you brought up a lot of good ones. You kept you're really good at keeping everything going back to uh, sort of that that initial checklist. I think you sent me so we could talk about. Um, I went off on tangents, but anyway, the <laughs> yeah, no, I did too. Hey, man, that's that's part of the learning process. Yeah. Is I'm an auditory processor. I think if you're listening to the podcast, is because you're auditory as well. So I think yeah. that's that's part of the growth. What um is there anything that we should have talked about we didn't talk about before we wrap it up? You know, I, I don't think so. I think that there's money can be overcome. Mm -hmm. You know, shorts are a great great way to do that, but but be ready. You know, aim for the fences, but hit singles. Yeah. You know, and then um get in, get into a group. You know, that helps with fear, that helps with accountability, time management, and all those things that you think you don't have, and through that you'll get resources. So no, I think those three things will hopefully help the film trooper and all of us out there. Yeah. Where, where can people get hold of you? What's the, the best way? Um, right now, the studio that I have is theforgestudios.com. And then my coaching is indiefilmcoach.com. Either one of those. Nice, yeah. nice. Hey, man, thank you so much for just bantering and taking time to hang with me and, you know, chatting some more. So uh, hopefully uh, everybody got some good value out of just being a fly on the wall. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. No, I'm a, I'm a fellow film trooper too. And I love talking film and shops. So 
Yeah, you know, it, it only your pain only makes sense if you can help others along the way. So hopefully, yeah, yeah. you know, this is <laughs> speaking from experience is how I've learned these things. So that concludes my interview with Ron Newcomb, the indie film coach. And you'll hear more of Ron, as I mentioned earlier in the podcast. Um, make sure you don't go away empty handed. There's a bunch of free things over at filmtrooper.com, including a free three part video series on the new adventures of film distribution. My God, I can't even say that word. Film distribution. (laughs) And the other thing, too, we just launched the Film Trooper Members Portal. It is a free membership that you have access to all these different um, tracks of where you want to go with your filmmaking career. And it's a collection of a bunch of things, just uh, content that is is there to help you. Again, that's at filmtrooper.com. And just look for the Members Portal um, link at the menu. And you can sign up for the free membership. All right. Well, thanks again for tuning in to the Film Trooper podcast. And we will see you next time. Film Trooper, empowering filmmaking entrepreneurs. 